see on the screen at the moment is an X-ray CT, computerized tomography image, uh, going through a person from head to somewhere about knee level. So here we use X-rays and we see the internal anatomy, so going through the legs, you can see the, uh, the, the leg bones there. What I'm going to talk about is cancer. Not perhaps the most exciting topic at the moment to talk about. But anyway, cancer starts with a single cell. And what makes cancer cells different to normal healthy cells is they don't know when to stop growing, they don't specialize, they remain mature, and healthy cells become specialized. So that'd be part of your liver or part of your brain. And when these cells uh, die, and cells are dying all the time in our bodies, it's a natural process, then the debris, if you like, float off and goes through the blood system or the hepatic system. And they don't attach anywhere. Cancer cells do. So that's their problem. And this is a section of the brain. This is a section of the cerebellum. This is your old part of the brain top of your spine, uh, beautiful structure, so there's the spines down at the bottom there, and you can see a tumour on the left hand side. So that's about what a tumour looks like. Uh, this is a pathological section, this is a section of a brain that's been stained. It's quite large, this tumour didn't kill this patient, this is actually quite a young patient. Um, died for some other reasons, but what you can see is that the tumour is growing, it's distorting the brain, it's being pushed against the side of the skull, it's going to cause lots of problems. And in this country, we have uh, about a thousand cases of cancer diagnosed every day. And of those patients, about 40% of them will receive radiotherapy as part of their curative treatment. And most of that radiotherapy is given by machines like this. This is a high energy source of x-rays, uh, driven by something called a linear accelerator or a linear. There's about 300 of those around the country. And what do x-rays do? Well, x-rays are ionizing radiation. An x-ray photon comes in, and it knocks off an electron uh, through an atom which is, you know, interacts with. So the atom becomes ionized because now it's lost a negative charge, so it's now a positive. So it's an ion. So we call this ionizing radiation. And what does that do? Well, what we want to do is to destroy the cancer cell's DNA. So here's a dual helix of, of DNA. The X-ray photon comes in, it destructs, knocks off some of those electrons disrupt some of those bonds, and now we have a dysfunctional DNA. Of course, that affects healthy cells as well as cancerous cells. Fortunately, um, the healthy cells recover faster than cancerous cells. So we give a, if you like, a dose of radiation, everything collapses on the floor, but the healthy cells get up quicker. This is why we give doses in radiotherapy fractions. But there are lots of other charged particles about. Photons are not really charged particles, but there are lots of other types of ionizing radiation. And one of those is from the nucleus of the atom, the proton. Positively charged, weighs about 2,000 2, times more than an electron at rest, and so we could probably use those. And this graph sums up the advantage of treating cancer with beams of protons rather than x-rays. The nice curve coming down is how the x-rays lose energy as they pass through tissue. So it gradually falls off, almost exponentially. This is why you have to use focus beams, completely different directions, because we're now putting a lot of radiation in healthy tissue, both before and after the tumor. And radiation in healthy tissue is never a good idea. Our protons, as you can see, they have a definite range. They go a certain distance into tissue. And we can alter that range by changing the energy of the protons. And most of that energy is lost 
near the end of their channel, like something called the Bragg feed. So here we have a way of putting all our energy, all our dose, in a fairly narrow region deep inside the body. So this is ideal. And it would be good for, particularly good for certain types of cancer tumor, uh, head and neck tumors, most brain tumors, tumors near uh, critical organs, uh, like the spinal cord, and also most tumors in children and young adults. Because you want to minimize the dose to healthy tissue. Because there's always a danger of second cancers developing much later in life, 20 years. So if I'm treated, who cares what happens in 20 years' time? But for you, we do care. So this is what the advantage of proton therapy is. But we have to get that distance just right. Because if we get it wrong, whoops, we get it wrong big style. Because we put the dose out of in the healthy tissue just before or just after the tumor. And to generate these, we have systems like this. You're looking here at about 100 million pounds worth of investment. Uh, the NHS will have two of these opening in the next two to three years, one in Manchester and one in uh, London. We generate the protons, energies up to about 200 million electron volts. In a cyclotron, we pass them because they're charged. We can alter their direction with electromagnets into a gantry, which is the height of a three-story house. Uh, and that focuses the beam onto the patient. So the gantry can move around to direct the beam from different angles. And then we can start focusing that energy uh, just actually on the tumor. We have a very narrow beam, a pencil beam as it's called. And if you like, it's almost like painting by numbers. That's what we like to do. The problem is that we get these ranges wrong. We get the distances wrong. Here we see these are what are called treatment, treatment planning maps. <coughs> On the left, there's a planning map for treating the brain tumor uh, with X-ray radiotherapy. Uh, and on the right, we could do it with proton radiotherapy. And you can see where the tumor is, where the high red spot is. That shows you that's where the most of the energy is going to be deposited. But you can see there's quite a big color wash around that tumor, much less here much less of the brain has been affected by some radiation. Similarly here, where we're trying to do a whole body dose down the spine, this is probably for leukemia, and we want to try and radiate the spine, but get nothing into the lung region. And we're going to do much better with protons than we are with x-rays. But again, we've got to get it just right. Because these are x-ray CT images, but we're treating with protons, and they're not the same. That is the problem. That is the big problem. And we get the range wrong. So we have accidents. And we don't want to do that. Um, the whole thing about radiotherapy is it's a very precise, careful science. So we take robust treatments, not optimum treatments. So we have to take into account all these errors so we don't get any problems. So you get a treatment that's not going to cause any harm, but it not, may not be the best treatment you could possibly have. So what we do is we try and image with these protons. Um, and this is our equipment. Very simple picture of it. There's my patient in the middle. There's his tumor. Um, proton beam is going to come in something like that. And we're going to get the energy just right, so the distance is just right, so it deposits most of its energy in that tumor. Now before that, you can see I've got something called proton trackers. And after the patient, I've got the same set of trackers, and then have something mysteriously labeled a range telescope. Because when I'm going to image the patient using protons, I've got to increase the energy of the protons so they get through the patient. But I reduce the number of them maybe 10,000 times. So as a dose of radiation, it's very, very small, has no, uh, it's only diagnostic. And I use a broad beam because I want to look at a nice big picture of the inside of the scale. And this, if you like, is one path that one single proton takes. And it's not like light, it doesn't travel in straight lines, it deviates a great deal. 
So if I'm going to image using protons, I've got to record every proton. Where it came from, where it went to. So it's not like clicking the shutter or pressing the button on your camera, where you don't have to worry about what the individual photons are doing. Here, I do need to worry. And what I do, when that individual proton comes in, these detectors get to the locations. I can draw a straight line and estimate where it enters the patient. The same proton I pick up at the other end and see that where it came out of the patient. Then I know what my initial energy of my protons were. This here measures the residual energy, what's left after it's been through the patient. So I know what energy that individual proton deposited in the patient, and I repeat that millions of times. And that's just for one projection, <coughs> beam coming from one direction. I move my equipment, one degree, two degrees, and repeat. And another one or two degrees, and repeat, till I've covered the full 360. And this is the sort of image we would hope to expect. <coughs> this is a patient receiving radiotherapy. He has a strange gauzy mask on him because his head is held in position so he doesn't move when he's having treatment. Uh, and there was no data for the end of his nose, so it looks a bit pee. But this is what a proton CT image would look like. And we can alter it. We can take off the flesh. It's still a living patient. Uh, and we can see the stool, we can put the flesh back, we can rotate it, we can take sections through it. And now I have an image that has been created by the same radiation type that I'm going to treat with. So if you like, I've got the same ruler. There are no errors. But, pro but imaging with protons is very difficult. So four years ago, I started a project, I lead a project, I've got five universities, five NHS trusts, uh, the National Labs of South Africa, uh, and also a hospital in Sweden. Uh, and this is what we built. This is Pravda, this is what it stands for at the bottom, and this is <coughs> our instrument in a proton therapy facility in South Africa, near Cape Town, being moved into position by some of my researchers. And it's big and it's bulky, but it's really the first time it's been done using totally solid state components as we'll show you more. So the heart of any system is the things that's going to detect the protons or detect the light in your camera, the sensors. And we use two types. One's called a silicon strip detector, which are just very fine strips of silicon diodes on a wafer of silicon. And the main use where they well the main place where they're used at the moment is in the Large Hadron Collider of CERN. It was these guys that detected the information that, that we know that was Higgs boson. So we had some design by the same guys who designed these for the Large Hadron Collider. And then in Lincoln, we started putting them together. And this is one of our proton trackers being assembled in our lab at the university. <coughs> and the other sensor we have is a CMOS sensor. Uh, you've all got a CMOS sensor on you at the moment because of that camera chip in your smartphone. Except that camera chip is four or five millimeters square, mine is five centimeters by 10 centimeters. It's about 500 times bigger, works 20 times faster, and costs a lot, lot more. So, what we built is probably one of the most complex medical instruments that have been conceived. We can track up to 25 million protons per second. The amount of data that comes out of it <laughs> is equivalent to 300 high-definition TV channels. I've got enough processed silicon to make 25,000 iPhone cameras. But what I'm doing is I'm imaging and I'm treating with the same type of radiation. So this reduces these errors. I'm using the same. Group. So now, we should be able to get the train to stop at the right place. So now, we should be able to have optimal treatments. We have treatments um, of critical tumors, which cannot be occupied treated at the moment. 
and this will be a great improvement, especially for paediatrics and young So, just stop in the right place. It does every other time. Okay, thanks very much because as I say, program safety will mean not just robust treatments but optimum ones. Thank you very much.